Hello everyone and welcome to the show. If you should awaken Welcome back. We have a very good show for you today, a very important show, because it's a very historical moment in the case of the scriptures. It is about the story of Moses. Now, ironically, the Egyptian text tells us that there were only two mass exodus from Egypt during that time. One of them was the Minoan volcano eruption that happened around 1600 BCE. The other was the exodus of Akhenaten. It happened 1570 BCE. Now the thing about the Moses account is that these pyramid tanks were written on the walls of the pyramid. Now, the way they were able to do that, they weren't carving directly into the pyramids except itself or on the walls therein. They would take a section and they would put plaster, white plaster on there, smooth that out, and as it began to cure, they would carve into it, while it was still soft, all the information that they wanted to put in there. And they would put it in colors and fashion, however, whatever they wanted to make. These were artisans that were creating historical events on the walls of the, not the pyramid's exterior itself, but within, inside the structure. If one of the pharaohs wanted to tell a story about his, the year he had, he would have a whole section of wall carved out, flattened out, so he could basically imprint on those walls a beautiful story that he wanted to be told. So now, we can't find information on the period walls about Moses. But perhaps that's because Moses was being chased and the person who was doing the chasing might have been the person who put the artistry on the walls for historic posterity. <laughs> so anyway, that may be the reason because we can't even find any historical pyramid text information on Jesus Christ as well. Jesus, of course, could have been on the pyramids because he lived in Egypt for a while if he were a, an important figure. Now, there was a scribe that worked and lived around the area where Jesus was from. But he wrote nothing about this Jesus or Yahshua. So it's hard to imagine how somebody as important as Jesus would be left out 
of that information. However, that same scribe described another man, and he called him the Egyptian. And this Egyptian moved around sort of like Jesus would have moved around. This Egyptian came in during the time Jesus would have. Now the reason I really like this Egyptian story is because we know from my research that Jesus Christ himself attended the mystery schools in Egypt. That's where he was taught, around 8 years old, from 8 to 12 years old, that's where he was. He was in those buildings, and that could have been the one that they called Jesus, eventually could have, very, very possibly could be the Egyptian. So, we know with the Minoan eruption that there was an exodus. Now. I'm not trying to say that there was not a Moses, but you do have to consider, you do have to wonder that how the main character, the main person in the Bible who was responsible for the whole Old Testament was able to take people from their home lead them through a separated ocean, lead them across a desert. In my opinion, it would be very difficult for somebody to talk to me into walking across a desert, and I know that I'm not going to be able to make it to the other end in my lifetime. You see, it took 80 years for them to cross that desert. So basically, we're, we're, we're jumping out and venturing on to a place where it had to be terrifying both day and night to exist there. So I want you to watch this video. It kind of compares the paradoxes between what could have happened in the Moses scenario or the eruption or Akhenaten. And we'll talk about this when the video is over. Be right back. Chapter 46 The Paradox Early Egyptian pyramid texts tell two stories of an exodus event taking place out of Egypt. The first such event was the Minoan eruption that took place between 1642 BC and 1540 BCE as the volcano Terra erupted. The other was the story of Akhenaten, born in Egypt between 1570 and 1380 BC. So similar were the two accounts that I find it necessary to mention that as a paradoxical contradiction, yet both events are recorded history. As extraordinary as the two narratives may be, it is the way the two happened and the what exactly happened that is the most powerful and interesting aspects of the two. In the Moses account the time was around 1406 BC and over a thousand years had passed since Abraham. Moses led the Jews into the holy land that had been promised by the God Yahweh. He received commandments from the God on Mount Sinai with specific instructions to lead the Hebrews through the Sea of Reeds into the Sinai Desert. It would be a journey that would consume 40 years of tremendous struggle and sacrifice. After being hidden from birth for years he was then reunited with his royal family. He would then threaten the Pharaoh with plagues until the Pharaoh had enough. This is indeed an oversimplification of this story that has been told a hundred times in a variety of differing ways. The similarities of the Pharaoh Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV are far-reaching in their themes and eventualities. Both of these accounts are well represented in literature and you need only a little research to find them. In this text however we have yet another scenario that is in fact as extraordinary as the two, if not more so. In the heavens a conflict had been brewing for a millennium. The gods if you will were beginning to become agitated with one another and the dispute of power was at hand. This would be the first event where a god would use a combination of extraterrestrial technology with humans to wage war against other gods. 
it would also be a time when the world's first created beings religions were formed. These religions required a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a divinity of faith if you will. Prior to this time the Anunnakis were the superior beings because of their sheer size and advanced minds as well as having the distinction of glowing eyes and skin. In heaven it was Jehovah's demand that there be no gods equal or above him, a conflict ensued that may still be raging in the heavens even today. The conflict was between the two advanced civilizations that ruled the planet Earth at the time, the Anunnakis and the Atlanteans. A heavenly meeting took place and the Atlantans were far under equipped to wage war against the sky people. The Anunnaki Remember long ago when Alalu, while traveling alone in space, first discovered Earth? Well, he had hidden on his ship a stockpile of atomic weapons, stolen from an armory on the Biru. There were enough devices to destroy the entire planet for thousands of years to come, and only his grandson knew of their concealed location. Hermes knew that the Atlanteans could gain an advantage by waging war that consisted of ground troops, and an assault from above, and also using his weapons of mass vibrations. Such a plan would be extremely complex, yet they need only enlist the assistance of Thoth to gain advantage. From the time the Anunnaki arrived on Earth, Thoth was reticent towards them. Later it became apparent that the Anunnaki were in fact responsible for the mass destruction caused by the flood event. This would become a great fear for the Atlanteans and much precaution would be taken in respect of to consort with the beings that believed they were the non-benevolent gods of Earth could become quite dangerous to all inhabitants therein. Thought turned to his father and uncles for advice as they were eager to give guidance to something that was so concerning. With careful consideration, Thought began to recognize some of the rules and structures necessary to create systems of beliefs that could command allegiance to the souls of man. Thoth was the person responsible for bringing the level of humanity to the barbarians of Egypt after the flood. The Egyptians held him in high regard. He was the first ruler of the land before there were pharaohs. Thoth knew that he must first find a group large enough to be of concern to the Anunnaki. Second it must be a group that would be so oppressed that war would seem to be one of life's improvements. Fourth, the time that it would take to manifest such a scenario must not exceed the lifetimes of the people's memories of the opposition they were enduring. Sustenance and the ability to escape an army would be paramount and the leader must be very persuasive, with a brilliance of mind about his leadership. They knew they would also need some form of magic to persuade the people. Once this army was established, they would attack one of the most fortified structures in the region of the Middle East. This would be the structure known as the Fortress of Great Walls at Jericho, erected around 8000 BCE. This fort was easy to defend as well as being impenetrable by but few sources known to the common man. The nearest dynastic imperialism could perhaps be extracted from Egypt. In Egypt where multitudes of building projects were underway because of their reverence to the power and majesty of their pharaohs. Yet the subordinates were not as disenchanted as was needed for an exodus. Many of the so-called oppressed people were quite content and the work was steady and not overwhelming and the hours were doable and not back-breaking. We must note that the early Egyptians did not construct the bulk of the Great Pyramids. They were erected shortly after the Flood and were necessary for interstellar landmarks. There were few humans after the devastation of the Flood event. The Egyptians that did work on the pyramids many years later were there to simply maintain and polish the structures. Once the cave dwelling beings became more civilized, they were taught simple things such as self-maintenance, language and to be non insistial They were not the usual slave type accoutrements involved in their disciplinary retributions such as whips and blades and blunt objects. It was more of a challenge to keep the antediluvian beings in the cities rather than the caves and forest. They were taught to raise families while educating their children with a livable salary, which was more like barter than employment, that would include housing and doable hours. They were well aware that a wounded worker in need of medical assistance was not a good formula for a successful build. There were also plenty to assist to the needs of the subordinates, such as water, breaks and not too long workdays. At the time, it was an honor to be a so-called 
Egyptian slave. There, the family structures were well taken care of. Health benefits were provided to all, so the non-productive workers rarely worked in the kingdom. So you see it would take quite an effort to persuade hundreds if not thousands of families from such comfort that Hebrews would have to commit to a 50-year trek across desert sands with little knowledge of what exactly the true reasons were. Thought and several pyramid priests began a campaign of educating them on a variety of subjects relating to spiritual deities in the heavens and how this could and would affect them. They were told story after story of the merciless powers that the gods were able to bestow upon the people. When the time came, Moses was in great disagreement and skepticism. He would later return as a spiritually enlightened Moses, with abilities that seemed supernatural and divine. The Hebrews would then be frightened into submission by a carefully planned chain of events, organized by Hermes and Lucifer, who was now trying to reconstitute his heavenly image. This deity had been looking for a chance to redeem himself and had knowledge of bush-burning magic and voice-over experience and would call himself Yahweh. Hermes who had begun to feel that the Anunnaki were indeed dangerous, because of their insistence of making the created beings believe that they should be feared or punished, or even destroyed, as they once were, because of their insolence. They were ready to follow Moses into the promised land after Moses had received orders from the god deity, who had impressed Moses with his display of might. Moses was totally unaware of flame accelerants, as he saw the bush and wondered how it could burn and talk, and talk and burn, with no person in sight. Moses did however understand the echo effect that the clefts provided. Yahweh made promises through Moses that the Hebrews, who had suffered long and hard for so many years, would be the first to enter into the kingdom of heaven. This heaven happened to be created just for a chosen people. For some reason, it was common for people to feel special if they were the chosen few that would exist in a realm with beings without diversity. If your belief system varied from another, you would forfeit your entitlement to the great kingdom and be doomed to exist for eternity in a place to suffer, even if the place was created by the same benevolent deity. Thank you. So now, you see, this is a very complex topic. So I'm just going to tell you my own opinion about the whole thing. In Egypt at the time, they worshipped a multitude of gods. They basically derived a lot of their information from Hermes. And in Hermes' pantheon, there were eight. Those were the Greek gods, of, of three of whom was one of them was Hermes' uncle, Two of them were Hermes' uncle, and one of them was, was his father, another his brother. So basically, I can understand how Hermes could be so important in the history of mankind because the people in the early parts of the development of mankind adopted their belief system as far as their gods were concerned, and there were many. But what happened, there was a period of time where one of the gods... One of the pharaohs was just a little different. And we're talking about Oman Hotep IV, Akhenaten, the spouse of Queen Nefertiti and father of Tutankhamun. This person, like I said, he looked a little different, meaning he always wore a cone-shaped headdress. Some believe it was because that was the shape of his head. Because shortly thereafter, you started seeing people who were trying to emulate him by binding the heads of children. They would wrap string around the heads to try to get the skull to form like Akhenaten's was. Well, Akhenaten was an original human being with that shaped head, however, that was a hallmark of the Anunnaki. So all he had to do was be in some linear 
Sometimes when you're created by a certain being, the DNA, it gets tangled in there. And sometimes the, the actual traits of the prior can come out, you know, into the singular. So Akhenaten and Nefertiti both could have had traits of the Anunnaki because of the shapes of their head. I believe that. I believe that because it, it would be too much of a coincidence for their... And, and, and they found all kinds of people with heads like that throughout history. That's, that's why I believe it, because we have found fossil remains of long, elongated skulls, is what they call them. Like I said, which is a trait of the Anunnaki. Now... What Akhenaten did was he basically rearranged the whole religious structure while he was in command, while he was the pharaoh. Instead of having several gods, the one right before him, they worshipped the sun god Ra. But we know now that the sun god Ra was actually Marduk. So... Akhenaten decided that he did not want to worship these idols. He wanted to create the first monotheistic religion. Mono meaning God, one God only. One God only. So basically what that meant was that all the pyramid priests would now have to convert to what he said was correct. And they didn't want to do that because their jobs were more secure when they got to worship and promote the things of the past. That's how they got paid. That's how they got their income for, for keeping the religion alive. So when Akhenaten comes along, he wants to change the religion. Now... This went on for a while, but like I said, it put a lot of people out of work. Ultimately, Akhenaten was run out of Egypt. This was an exodus. The first thing he did was he felt that he didn't want to live in the city. So he created his own city. And I mean, when he built this city, he built it in a place where... Everything was naturally beautiful, where everywhere he looked, there was nothing but something scenic to look at. The city was called Amana. And the amazing thing about this city is they did very little writing about it. They did very, very little writing about Akhenaten. Akhenaten was the Egyptian pharaoh that was erased from history because they wanted to go back to what they believed before he got there. So they basically tried to destroy everything that he had ever created. With modern day archeology, span they were able to find that city. They were able to find these blocks in Egypt and reconstruct Akhenaten city. They were able to do that because all they did was they made, took a wall from here and and moved it and made a wall over here and, and, and they constructed buildings that way. They were able to reconstruct Akhenaten City with the blocks that were found here. That's why we know it happened. That's why we know it was a fact. That's why we know Akhenaten was not just a myth. So they know all they need to know about all the stuff you hear about Akhenaten and Nefertiti. They were able to find these things. One of the reasons why is because of all the stories about the wealth of Egyptians, how Egyptians were so wealthy and they would bury the wealth of the pharaohs. Well, the problem is they could never find any of that wealth. Never, there wasn't, there were not a pharaoh buried in the Great Pyramids. And they could not find this wealth. Wherever they found a tomb of a pharaoh was empty. And, of course, we understand why. We understand why because of looters. You know, whoever was in charge of putting it there probably was also in charge of the operation of sneaking back and getting it out. So they were looted. Back in the late, I think it was around in the 40s, they were doing some excavating around trying to find things. And a young boy ventured out into the desert. And once he got far enough away, he 
he he stepped his foot fell into a hole and he was like oh well, there's a hole here so he tried to look down into the hole and of course it was dark completely dark so what he did was he ran back to the guy who he was working for who was the head of the archaeological pro project he showed him where he found this hole and this hole changed the entire fabric of the of the history of Egypt because in that hole they put lights down and they opened it up and they went down there and they found something extraordinary they found the tomb of King Tut Tutankhamun and nobody had disturbed this particular tomb all of the gold and all of the stuff that was supposed to be in a pharaoh's tomb was in there this was quite peculiar because Akhenaten wasn't a very popular pharaoh at all he was only 13 when he came into power when they made his father exodus his father left so Tutankhamun didn't really have too much to do. He wasn't going to come back and basically pick up Egypt where they left off. So basically they want to get rid of him too. But in so doing, they were able to put him in an obscure location. They called it K4, I believe right now. And so basically this was a place where minor pharaohs were buried, not the important ones. The important ones were over here that was looted. They found him over here, but guess what? It was like verification. If he had all this gold, and this is the same tomb of the Pharaoh Tutankhamun that travels all over the world now, so people can actually see the actual artifacts. They only had the artifacts from one Pharaoh, and that is Amenhotep. No, no, Amenhotep's son, Tutankhamun. But it's a very elaborate, very, I've been to see it myself. And, and what was in there were very pharaohish. So, it is believed that if they can do that much for this minor deity, what could they, have, what could they possibly have done for the bigger ones? But they couldn't find that gold because it had all been looted. So, thank you for being here today, and um, I hope you enjoyed that. We're about to go into, just because of the Ten Commandments and all of this, I went ahead and created a visual for the Exodus of Moses. Keep in mind, I lean more towards the Exodus of Akhenaten. But, like I said, the reason the Moses account may have been erased, could have been because the Pharaoh in charge did not want to put that on the pyramid text. So I'm not saying Moses didn't exist, I'm just saying that it's not written in stone. Okay, thank you for coming, and we'll see you next time.
So, so we, we can purchase the light button.